everybody, this is Ben Atkinson at LinkedIn and welcome to our interview series, Inspiring Leadership. And we're going to be interviewing um, Richard Fenning on the subject of um, risk, problem solving, high stakes problem solving and in recovery as well. As always, we have uh, my Jonathan Bowman Perks uh, along for the ride to, and to, to run the interview. Um, if you'd like to ask any questions, please do. It'd be great to hear from you. Uh, Jonathan, who are we interviewing this week? Ben, thank you very much indeed, and welcome to my favorite time of the week. And I'm very pleased to have Richard Fenning back with us. Richard is um, an advisor at the moment to Control Risk, but he's had a career of 28 years with Control Risks, and for, for many of the last few years, he was the CEO. So a, a wealth of understanding of the geopolitical and the complexity of organizations and companies and countries uh, going through challenges and risks like the current one we've got now with COVID-19. And Richard's also now and has been a leader who's used mentoring and coaching throughout his time as CEO, and he's moving into doing that full time. Uh, and we wish you every success with that. Richard, uh, lovely to have you on. What's, what's from a personal point of view, um, how has or has not the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic been affecting you and your family and the way you work? Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you, Ben, also for inviting me today. Um, in terms of how it's impacted me, I am the part of the very lucky 1%. Um, I, ha I haven't suffered from uh, the virus, uh, nor as any member of my family. Um, I have been here in London uh, for the duration. I've been able to go to work um, most days and continue working. I don't have small children. Uh, I don't have dependent elderly relatives. Uh, therefore, I feel as if I have been incredibly privileged mm -hmm. and frankly fortunate to have, to have got through this. Um, I'm slightly tempting fate by saying that because having said that i'll probably be struck down by the wretched virus um on my way home this afternoon um but it does it does remind me um that actually very few people are as fortunate in this regard as as i have been actually uh this is not an equal opportunities virus it has affected people in very very different ways uh, dependent on all sorts of things, obviously depend on your health, your socioeconomic circumstances, and where, of course, where you are in the world. So, yeah, no, thank you very much for asking. But, um, yeah, I'd like to be able to tell you that I, I battled it off with great heroism and gallantry, <laughs> but uh, that wouldn't be true. And, and you're in London at the moment as well, aren't you, Richard? Yes, I'm in London, yeah. And going to a, an empty office. And go to an empty office. Bye bye. Lots of, lots of floor space. You keep changing desks just to exactly talk, talk to yourself. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, for years, so that's, that's in your time in the CEO there, in that normally very busy office, um, tell those who don't know um, what Control Risk does uh, around the world, uh, and and the fascinating aspects of it as it deals with a, a range of very complex, uh, wicked problems. Yeah. So Control Risks is one of those organizations that is kind of dedicated to helping people understand and manage risk. In a control risk context, that generally means um, political risks, security risks, uh, fraud, corruption, cybersecurity risks, um, a whole range of things that happen broadly speaking, due to human malfeasance of one sort or another. It's interesting, when I started in that world back in 1993, what we did was right on the margins of ordinary business life. We dealt with very low probability, but high impact problems that may beset an international company, it may have been something as extreme as the kidnapping of an executive or people being caught up in a coup or a revolution or some kind of dramatic world event. The sort of stuff that grabs the headlines, the sort of stuff that has a very significant negative impact on the individuals in the organization, but broadly speaking happens not that often to not that many people. 
Mm. Um, what happened during the nearly three decades I was I was there was that range of risks that affect international businesses expanded exponentially as the global economy expanded. And the kind of business we were engaged in moved from the periphery, from the margin, much more into the mainstream. And what the dynamic behind that, the motor behind that, was globalization. If anybody remembers globalization, it was a big hot topic until quite recently, and then it was sort of declared illegal and a verboten word, and you couldn't talk about globalization anymore. But it was quite important for a while, I seem to remember. Basically, the global economy in the last 30 years has, has kind of multiplied. Economic activity has shifted from North America and Europe and Japan to a whole range of other countries. Trade barriers have come down. Capital mobility has gone up. Um, labor mobility has gone up. And essentially, the world has reshaped itself in probably the most unprecedented fashion. And the kind of central pillar of a lot of that has been the growth of China, which we might come back to. And in and amongst all of that, it's thrown up so many new opportunities, so much new economic activity that an organization like Control Risks that is about helping people deal with the downside implications of a lot of the unfamiliarity and the new circumstances that people find themselves in, business proliferated. And I was lucky enough to be at the helm of an organization that was riding a very buoyant wave of global economic expan expansion punctured by some dramatic world events whether that be the global financial crisis, 9-11, the 9-11 Middle Eastern wars, as I say, the economic rise of China. There's a whole range of things that happened against this backdrop of economic expansion. And if you're in the risk management business, okay, success was not guaranteed, but we were in a, in a good position to try and kind of grow a business in a new, a new kind of type of activity but as I say, it hitherto been somewhat guarded on the outskirts of normal business activity suddenly became something much more mainstream. Mm. And, and some would say that uh, you had the Goldilocks syndrome um, as you were dealing with all these different global crises. You know, do you get too involved in this one or too little involved in this one or do you just get it right? I mean, I, I was, I'm enjoying reading General Jim Mattis's book call sign chaos, and I don't know whether you met him in your travels, um, but he was talking about the crescent of all those countries that they talked about, and Afghanistan and Iraq and Iran and everything that's gone on with it. Um, and control risk got quite drawn into, particularly Iraq, I understand, and maybe I don't know Afghanistan. Was it, do you reckon you got it just right? Was it too much? Did, did it take your eye off all the other things? I mean, what, what's your view on the Goldilocks and I'm just getting it right. <laughs> <laughs> it's just getting it right, yes. Uh, really, really difficult. Timing timing is everything. And these waves come along uh, and you're faced with, in our, in, our, in our terms, opportunity to be able to help people in these very diff difficult environments. You can't control the timing of those. You have to be able, as an organization, to respond with agility and imagination. Uh, it's not a time for rigid strategic planning. It's a time for creative improvisation of your business plan. We found that at Control Risks in 2003, 2004, after the invasion of Iraq, and to a certain extent the same in Afghanistan, after the invasion of Iraq, there was a huge influx into Iraq of all sorts of all sorts of people, diplomats, aid workers, business people, reconstruction experts, at the same time that the security situation in Iraq, which for a short period of time was reasonably stable after the invasion and then plummeted downhill rather dramatically. And I remember those days vividly of having to, on a day-by-day -day basis, improvise the next response to an unprecedented level of client demand 
inevitably, Jonathan, you miss things when that happens mm. because you've got to be able to do you've got to be able to deploy people, talent, creativity, money to be able to make this happen. You have to be able to delegate effectively. You can't centrally control that stuff. You have to find the right people and let them get on with it. But we don't have perfect 360 degree vision. We don't, we, we inevitably get drawn into the thing. You know, when your hair's on fire, that's what kind of preoccupies you. Um, and it did feel like that a little bit. Yeah. And a few years later, other things came along as well. And the whole emergence of cybersecurity, for instance, and the challenges around the fact that companies exist now swimming in an ocean of big data that they can barely even, that the human brain doesn't really have the cognitive capability and imagination to understand quite how vulnerable and how much big data there is out there. And that all requires a different, different kind of response as an organization. Um, so yes, you're, you're essentially always, I think, in a business like that, you're triaging the, the kind of next set of challenges and circumstances. Yeah. If at the, end, at the end of each month you make some money, that almost feels like a bonus. <laughs> well, you, you've had a, a wealth over those 28 years of experience of different crises and challenges. We're, of course, all drawn to the hair on fire scenario at the moment with COVID-19. Yeah. And the question that Ben and I were interested in is uh, how do you think the world has has really dealt with this current crisis, your, your views on who's done it well, who's done it badly, uh, some lessons from it, uh, and, and the ego of various leaders. So, you know, how, how has the world dealt with the crisis, do you think? So I'm going to preface everything I'm about to say by kind of readily admitting that it's easy in, with the benefit of some limited hindsight to sound incredibly wise. And I have every sympathy for people who are in the hot seat having to make these kind of decisions about how countries and companies should should respond. So if I sound a little critical, it hopefully is done from a position of some humility, knowing that this is an incredibly difficult, difficult situation. But essentially, the uh, response of different leaders has all been about a trade off been a trade-off between public security and the, the communal wealth of the nation, between health and economics, essentially. And you see some countries, Taiwan, South Korea, would be good examples where the government was well prepared, maybe even include China to a certain extent in that, um, the, where the government was well prepared on the basis of experiencing something similar, notably the SARS epidemic from a few years ago, mm. uh, and willing to take early and significant, possibly even draconian measures to try and curb this before it took hold. And other nations unwilling or unable to learn those lessons, lacking in some way the kind of imagination to say, well, if it can happen there, it can happen here. Largely because Europe didn't really experience the SARS epidemic, we assumed it wasn't going to be a European problem. And I guess the same, the same somewhat suspect logic was applied in North America. So it, 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 it's a question of those countries, those governments that had some sense of foresight based on prior experience, a willingness to be clear-eyed and sober about their assessment of what could happen, and a willingness to trade, to make the trade-off. And it's too early to tell. History will tell us whether that trade-off was ultimately worth it. What damage we have collectively inflicted on the global economy was that was that price worth paying very hard in the midst of it now for us to be able to really say that with any any great certainty mm. it's very hard to strip out the emotional impact of what it's felt like for all of us but particularly those who really suffered at this 
it's really hard to strip that out and make that, as I say, clear-eyed, sober assessment of the trade-off that has been made. But the notion that this was a surprise for mankind is, is evidently a nonsense. Plenty of evidence that governments were aware of the pandemic risk, but as a society, we collectively chose, in many cases, not to really prepare for it. And in some cases, we show great lack of willingness to respond to it when it arrived. Yeah, that's very good. And we've got some good questions coming in already. Um, I do want to talk about geopolitical trends that you're noticing in a minute. But I think, Ben, do you want to put up the first uh, question from Nigel? Sure. One second. So Nigel Jefferson, thank you. Um, Nigel's question there um, for you, Richard. What's your thoughts? Well, how, how do you manage risk when improvising? Well, if I, if I think I understand Nigel's question correctly, it's, it's this sense of when you find yourself having to respond very quickly um, and take all sorts of kind of rapid decisions that probably you would prefer to take at a more leisurely considered pace, you inevitably run risk. Mm. One of the things we noticed early on in the pandemic a few months ago was people making very quick decisions about um, closing down parts of their business, moving people into a virtual workplace, um, taking big financial risks with the organization, things that under normal circumstances, there would be a foreboding sense of liability attached with making some of those decisions. Yeah. But people took them very, very, very quickly. And in so doing, took quite a lot of risk. And there will be there will be a period in the not too distant future where everything that major companies did will be gone over with a fine tooth comb. Um, this is a litigious society that we live in, mm. and it's a society which, and, and probably quite rightly, everything is subject to the benefit of hindsight and auditability, and there will be a long process of determining who made the right decisions and who made the wrong decisions. Mm. But at the, in the moment, people have to make those kind of big calls about how to rapidly restructure the business when they see what's happening. And they can't, they're doing, sorry, they're doing so without enough time, without enough information, and under quite a lot of, quite a lot of stress. Yeah. Um, and that's that's what I mean by by improvisation. Yeah. Um, in an ideal world, you would do it slower. You'd have more time. You'd have more more data, more availability of resources, more time to sort of go round, build, doing the consensus building, getting everybody on side. More time to kind of consult lawyers and all the other prophylactic measures that businesses generally like to take. This kind of environment back in March and April, people were making big decisions about shutting down whole swathes of the economy uh, ahead of government guidance, ahead of any kind of new government framework in which to do so. Uh, in some ways, that's much easier than where we are now, where we're trying to reopen the economy. We're trying to get our businesses back going, back going again. In some ways, it's much easier to sort of take the hard, dramatic decisions to stop doing something than it is to start doing them again. And that's the situation we now find ourselves in. Mm. Are you surprised how, how ill-prepared we really, really were for something that was, was actually quite predictable? Um, yeah, I, it, 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 in some ways it was, but that... Uh, capacity of smart people to uh, use their initiative is really quite remarkable. Uh, I was with uh, a good friend of mine who, very senior lawyer at a very large American bank, probably should remain nameless. And I was with him on vacation just as this whole thing was starting to unfold. And they were way ahead of it. 
they were making big decisions over the weekend about shutting down, essentially shutting down the operations, of the traditional operations of the bank and moving it online weeks before any kind of government guidelines came out. You've got smart people in a well-resourced organization who just get it, just get that this mm. is going to be bigger than anybody else is, is realizing. Mm. And even after all those decades and years of working in the risk industry, I was sitting there thinking, are they over? Are they overdoing this? Are they are they jumping the gun? Is this an abundance of caution? Is this an excess of prudence? Actually, it wasn't. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I am, I'm surprised in some ways that, that many of the sort of preparatory steps for a global pandemic or a national pandemic were not in, in place. Mm. But I was also had the opportunity, as I say, to be super impressed with the capability of smart people mm. in organizations to kind of move rapidly. Mm. And something you said earlier um, when we were speaking that, that you felt that um, ego had played a, a really big yeah. part in, in the decision maker of the of leaders, leaders have made um, globally. Um, and and I, I wonder if that sort of translates to, um, to, to business as well. Could, could you just sort of elaborate on, 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 on the comments you made, made earlier about that? So, I'm going to try really hard not to sort of appear really, <laughs> um, to, to, to sort of take a kind of political stance on this. But every, every politician, every business leader is, of course, driven to a greater or lesser extent by their craving for popularity and their need for for positive affirmation of their own their own ego but it's to a greater or lesser extent nobody has zero even chancellor merkel in germany he's often quoted or jacinta hearn in in new zealand are often held up as examples of low ego leaders which i think is a reputation that in the main is is well deserved but even they don't have zero so every everybody sits on on some kind of spectrum here Mm -hmm. But if you're over on that far side of the spectrum where most of your decision making is strongly influenced, strongly colored by how this is going to play in your own popularity at a reasonably low common denominator, then you're going to mess this up. There's no other mm -hmm. way, no other way to say it. And if your if your ongoing decision making, your decisions can be wrong and the public will forgive you if you have used all available information and you've acted not in your own personal best interest, but in the best interest of the nation. Can't be expected mm. to get it right, either for your company or for your country, whichever capacity you're kind of operating in. But they will not forgive you if you've been motivated by, by the wrong impulses. Um, and that's a, in any crisis that I've ever witnessed or been involved in, it's that ability to stop and check yourself and think, why am I making this decision? Why are we doing this? Is this, on balance, the right decision to make for the collective good of the organization, regardless of how it's going to personally play out for me in the short term? Mm. really tough and as i say yeah. none of us are immune from those considerations but we all sit oh, in the spectrum and those business leaders those political leaders who are able to, to 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 risk being wrong early on for the right reasons are probably going to come out of this with their credentials mm. enhanced rather than otherwise yeah yeah, and right fact, reasons. We, trust the science as well. <laughs> yeah, we, we've got um, Don, who's also in the risk business. Don McIntyre, mm. um, let's put Don's question up. Don's had a good conversation with a couple of other guys on there, uh, and they were also mentioning New Zealand with Jacinda uh, Arden. Um, but uh, that's a separate one. H how about this one? What's your thoughts on uh, on this, Richard? Uh, I, yeah. Don, I'm, I'm sort of unclear 
whether what we're talking about here is specific to what we're going through at the moment uh, or whether that's a, a kind of general question. And like everybody else in, in corporate life, we're all competing. We're all competing for the attention and the headspace of the kind of senior executive leadership team in any organization. I would say that if you're in the information security part of any business, you've probably been getting quite a lot of of, a, of, of attention and frankly allocation of budget in the last few years. Mm. One thing we have noticed, and Don, I'm sure will have noticed this, is that it has for kind of cyber criminals and the kind of whole hacking community, uh, this whole shift to online working, this whole shift to home working has been an absolute playground. It's been an absolute godsend for them, much to the detriment of, of, of the rest of us. Uh, it's had a serious negative impact on a lot of information security protocols for obvious reasons. If everybody's dialing in over an internet connection from home uh, and you're not operating all within the secure inner framework of an organization, it makes everybody much more vulnerable. Um, so it has been a particularly acute period for information security in the last few months. And also typically dealing with a generation of people who are now largely in charge of organizations who did not grow up in the digital age and therefore feel a greater sense of vulnerability about information and cyber security than they do about most other things because they just don't have decades of reference in how to really calibrate those risks Finally, Actually, can we can we can we just bring you slightly in screen a bit since we just lost you off off the edge of the camera Okay. There we are. Well, you're back yeah. in. That's great. Yeah. And, and also on the cyber side, it is such an interesting one with the, the threat of North Korea, of China, of Russia, who have battalions of hackers who are busy on cyber. And it's, it's their new way of waging hybrid warfare, call it what you want. Um, how, how big is the problem of cyber now and to, to people personally as well as to organizations? Yeah, it's a whole, it's a whole, it's a whole new context of vulnerability for organisations and 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 for countries. You got to remember about cyber warfare at its most kind of elementary level. It's extremely cheap, mm. Jonathan. Compared to the kind of warfare that you were engaged in in your career, which has always relied on the the bravery and commitment of individual soldiers, but relied on enormous capital expenditure to allow it all to happen. Mm. Cyber warfare is extremely cheap. Yeah. It's cheaper than a bow and arrow. Mm. Um, and it really is it really is that simple. You you, you need a, a malicious 17 year old with a laptop and you're up and running in terms of an offensive cyber capability. Um, I exaggerate for emphasis, but you take the point. Um, it really is a very cheap, cheap way of of waging war, of settling scores, of stealing money, whatever motivation uh, anybody may have. It's much cheaper than most of the alternatives. Yeah, it's very interesting. The other thing, as Ben was saying, we had a fascinating conversation before we started, and I was uh, very interested uh, when the information battle first somebody said, um, very interested in the fact you say it's. Um, it's 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 a stratified stratified society, and if you're under the age of forty, statistically, it's quite irrelevant for you. Um, tell us a bit more about your perception of that. I find that very interesting. Well, I think that's absolutely the case. I think inevitably, when the whole uh, pandemic response um, came about, I guess in March of this year, um, people talked a lot about kind of everybody as a community pulling together. And there was a lot of language used by, by, by all of us about we're all in this together, we've all got to pull together, 
the sacrifices we, we've got to make in terms of our curtailing our personal freedoms are all for each other. And people use the phrase, we're all in this together. So it's, it's, it affects everybody. Well, it doesn't affect everybody. That's one thing we now realize, and I think we realize quite soon. So your medical vulnerability to this is determined by age and health. Your ability to be able to cope with the curtailment of freedom and the alteration to your working life is determined a lot by your circumstances, by whether you've lost your job, whether you've been furloughed, whether you haven't lost your job, whether you're at home in a with screaming children in a in a small apartment, or whether you're able to have more space and childcare. It's 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 very obvious and it's very well documented that this affects different parts of society in, in very different ways. Uh, and I, I understand why people want to talk about, we're all in this together, let's all pull together. Because it's important to get that sense of kind of powerful community response to it. Um, but equally, as organizations have now adapted themselves to doing with this, they've realized that they've got to treat different parts of the employee population differently. Some people, and I include myself in this, frankly able to sort of move through this without very much infringement or change to my normal everyday circumstances, apart from the fact I spend my day talking to a computer, not a human being. But, you know, it's just a, it's just a different, it's just a change of medium. Um, but for other people, this has been, this has been profoundly affecting and to understand that within your within your workforce, people are experiencing it in such radically different ways. There was also a lot of talk, and you'll remember this, of I think politicians and commentators talking, invoking the blitz spirit in Britain, that we faced we faced big perils before as a as a community, and I think I get that too, but in reality. The Nazis are not in Calais about to invade Britain. The Luftwaffe is not destroying British cities. There isn't an existential threat to our way of life in the way that there was in 1940. And I think it is, it's understandable, but I think it's also important to calibrate our response as a society, to really focus on what it is that we're dealing with here. And it is unpredictable, timescales are uncertain, but we have it within our capability to make this problem return to a manageable level through the combination of the right decisions, the right investment, and the passage, the passage of time. It, it, it isn't the same peril that we faced in the past, and it doesn't affect us all in, in equal measure. Yeah, and, and you've got some great stories of different leaders and different teams who've handled it in different ways, not just this COVID-19. I mean, all the different crises you've had whether it be the financial crisis or problems with Iraq and Afghanistan. If you were to talk about um, inspiring leaders in a crisis and inspiring teams and how they've handled it well, and then the toxic ego for leaders and the toxic teams, just give us some stories without, obviously without the names being mentioned because you want to protect the guilty and the innocent, but, or maybe the innocent you can mention because they are inspirational, but they, the toxic ones now. Just, just tell us a few personal stories over the 28 years. It's interesting when something dramatic happens uh, in an organization, how tempting it is for everybody to throw out everything that makes them successful, to throw all that out of the window. So that ability to have a diverse group of opinion within your senior leadership team or within your organization and I mean, diverse in every sense of the word, in including teams that are cognitively diverse. You've got people who think differently, who challenge each other, who don't see the world in the same way. And that's what often makes companies great, is that ability to synthesize, or makes great leaders, is that ability to synthesize very radically different views, to avoid groupthink, to avoid the temptation to all 
jump on the bandwagon behind the person with the loudest voice in the room. That, in my estimation, ability to resist all that and run a genuinely cognitively diverse company is what makes one of the foundations of great leadership. When something goes wrong, that normally gets ditched and we do all run after the person and it's generally a man with the, loud, with the loudest voice in the room who can be the most compelling, the most persuasive and frankly just talk everybody else out. And actually, I think great crisis leadership is about doubling down on that cognitive diversity, not suppressing it. But you have to find a different pace with which to do things. And that's, I think, one of the things that people find most demanding and most tricky is how you dial up decision making, the speed of decision making, without losing that ability to have all the checks and balances of different voices, different opinions, different thought processes going on in the room at the same time. Mm. Um, there is something as well about stamina, about the ability of people to set in a crisis, to set a pace of work that they can all cope with. It's super easy to exhaust yourself and exhaust everybody else by just driving yourself too hard too quickly. Just staying um, with that one for a minute, Richard. Um, yeah. My experience with many different clients is that now at about month five, I'm seeing them flag, that they're just getting cool. exhausted. And in some of the uh, senior military men, you know, they said that we're on a six month tour in Afghanistan or Iraq, and we work really full on. But when the Americans worked alongside us, they worked for 12 months at that pace. And they were particularly machismo and trying to work till midnight and get up at five. They, they literally burnt out because they got so exhausted. And I'm seeing this. People are not pacing themselves. They think of this as a sprint, not a marathon. Yeah. And as a result, they're not renewing and refreshing and thinking. They're just busy, busy, back to back, zombie Zoom calls. With, yeah. with no time to reflect, as you say, in the margins, in the old days, the margins between walking to meetings, they'd chat with people, they'd think about stuff, they'd reflect. They're not, they're just, they're just um, doing, 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 but they're paid to think. What's, what's your thoughts? Yeah, no, I'm, I, it, it, it's very clear. And, and I think there is what is often compounded or compounds that problem is an assumption that you must have all the answers for everybody. Um, and I think particularly in the, in the early days, people put a lot of pressure on themselves by trying to be very clear about what was likely to happen. And it's a very human need to do that. We all need, we all need to see the path through the woods. We all need to see, you know, select your simile we all need to see the light at the end of the tunnel etc but i think once you get into this and everybody realized it was complex and it was difficult and the science was shifting then you mentioned the science <clears throat> trusting the science before one of the difficulties here is that the kind of scientific data scientific evidence has been shape-shifting in front of us uh, as, as we've kind of gone through this um and i think there comes a point where you've got to do, as Jonathan says, you've got to take stock of your physical stamina and your capabilities, but also willingness to share ambiguity and not be ashamed or afraid of the fact that the future is somewhat ambiguous. What people require is that you're on it, you're thoughtful, you're determined, you're energetic, but you're not giving them a false sense of unrealistic expectations and a false a false hope about when this may be over. Yeah. And I think mm. if, you can, if if as a leader you, you will you will continue to take people with you as long as they feel that you're on it and you're energetic and you're stable and you're not going to be any of those things if you're physically and mentally exhausted. Yeah. And it's about mm -hmm. taking leadership in this in this situation. One one person cannot be expected to have 
all the answers and be able to carry it through for the duration. No, and someone said it's the it's the incomplete leader with the complete team that that they can take a break and be refreshed because they've got a number two who'll step up, and they must do that because because they need to be fresh and thinking well, otherwise the organisation jerks around in different directions. Yeah, and um, one of the things that uh, Professor Roger Steer said in one of our sessions was, you know, good leaders with moral integrity have humour, humility, and um, uh, humanity and um, it, on that topic of humor what what uh, what's amused you over those years of different crises and risk management there must be a, a good funny story which gives a little bit of humor in those dark those dark moments as well where something funny happens when everybody's been stressed and strained for so long as people are starting to now there are there are numerous and I there are there are lots of situations where I would absolutely agree with that. And some of it in retrospect is very black humor. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't retell well uh, in the cold light of day very often. Uh, but it is such an essential component of, of kind of bringing, bringing people together, of being able to diffuse those levels of anxiety. And there's a difference between, if you like, well-timed surgical incision of humor versus kind of random jocularity that indicates that you're not really taking this very seriously. <laughs> um, but you're right. It's important that people, uh, I like that very much, the, the combination of humor, humility, and humanity is very, very sensible, very sensible advice. There is a, a sense that we all want our leaders to be carved out of granite and robust to the nth degree. And it's an unrealistic expectation. It comes in part, I think, from this modern cult of the all conquering, all powerful CEO, um, which I think is a sort of, in many cases, just a remuneration conspiracy. <laughs> paid frankly too much money and have to justify it by claiming kind of superhuman powers and in my experience corporate leadership is teamwork it's a team it's a team-based activity um there are certainly moments where the individual has to step up and kind of take control but for the main good leadership is about leading from behind during the good times and only stepping forward to lead from the front when things go really very badly awry, and then knowing when to step back again, and to Jonathan's point about kind of rotating reserves of leadership through an enduring and long-running running crisis. Um, but I do think there is something very destructive about this cultish devotion that we have to the notion that the world, the business world in particular, revolves around series of iconic superhuman leaders in my experience they are they're not just few and far between they're unicorn like in their rare in their rarity mm. and, and most businesses are hugely successful and don't need that kind of don't need that kind of leadership yeah that, that's a great point so ben over to you yeah, it'd be great to um, hear from anybody that's watching. If you'd like to ask any questions of Richard, it'd be, it'd be lovely to, to, to get some interaction. Um, but while we're doing that, uh, we would like to hear a bit more from you, Richard, about some of the habits that have that made you successful over the years. So we sort of switch gears at this, this point in the interview and ask you some, some quick fire um, questions just about some of the, the, the habits and, and um, things that you sort of live your life by. So three buckets healthy wealthy and wise so on the side of healthy obviously you've experienced and um given advice to to, to businesses and people during some pretty pretty um stressful um situations how do you um yourself and advise other people to remain healthy both mentally and physically um during times of stress and crisis um it's super, it's super important. And I think one thing on the health front, I think one thing that 
has come out of one positive thing that has come out of COVID is a much greater clarity and understanding about the importance of personal physical health and mental health uh, right across right across this right across this country. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we pay equal equal if not greater weight to mental health as well as to phys physical health. Um, I, I've only really had two strategies for dealing with this. And one is entirely kind of accidental and the other is just good genes. I have a reasonably robust constitution touch wood and I've just been a bit kind of suck it up and get on with it. The other accidental uh, advantage I have is that when it comes to virtually all form of sporting endeavor that requires talent and coordination, I don't have any. <laughs> the, only thing, the only thing I can do is run in an ungainly and unsightly fashion, but I can generally keep going. <laughs> um, as I was as I was told at school, pain is only weakness leaving the body. Um, so I've been fortunate in that I've had this reasonably efficient way to try and keep my cardio health, my nose above the waterline as far as that's concerned. Mm. That's, that's just because I'm useless at everything else. Um, <laughs> the rest of it, I've kind of had to just rely on the good genes that I inherited from my parents. Um, mm. In terms of wealth, it's my, my, my mantra has always been never to worry about it. Um, <laughs> in terms of, in terms of wor worrying about kind of what's, what's coming next. I am as an individual, like many people, I am motivated way more by the fear of failure than I am by the lure of, lure of success. And mm. that, I think, has, for me at least, meant that I've never aspired to any of the sort of material um, fripperies of the modern world. I'm just being fearful to avoid penury. And that's been quite, <laughs> uh, that's been quite motivational. And wisdom, it is way premature for me to ever, ever think that I might have even a, even a hint of that. Um, I've always been a great believer uh, in management by pebble in the shoe, always feeling slightly uncomfortable, always feeling that something isn't right, never, ever allowing yourself to rest on your laurels. Hubris being the absolute number one enemy of good mm. leadership and good management. So I'm not sure whether that answers your three no, yeah, that, that's that's great, and um, yeah, that's uh, good advice across across the board. Yeah. Um, I, I had a couple of uh, just additional questions, um, just uh, sort of looking at some of the things you said said in uh, in our conversation before um, about high stakes problem solving. Um, I, it'd be it'd be great for you to elaborate on what that is and and, and how how you do it well, because I think that going through this this um, crisis really sort of illustrated. Um, I think for a lot of people, both in their working life and, and in their personal life, that they, there's a good way of problem solving um, during crisis, and there's probably a, a pretty bad way of doing it. Yeah. So I think we've already we've already touched on it, and it's that ability to take contrary or contrarian advice and assimilate it very quickly. Hmm. Um, and I think that's you know, what I mean by high stakes problem solving is where the consequences of getting things wrong are very significant in terms of money, in terms of human life, in terms of the success or failure of, of your organization. And it's that ability to be able to stay calm or as calm as you can to listen to other people's opinions, to listen to dissenting opinion, to listen to introverts, to listen to people who are naturally quiet, to tune out a little bit the loudest voices in the room. Mm. And to at the end of the day, you're going to you're going to take a bet. You're not going to act with absolute certainty. And a willingness to understand that and that you 
can only be comfortable about the fact that you've made the decision with the best of endeavors. You haven't made it with the best of information. You haven't made it with the best of many other things that you may want to to have at your disposal. Yeah. You, you have listened. You have assimilated. You've gone round. You've checked again. But ultimately, you've got to make a decision. And sometimes it'll be right, and sometimes it won't be right. But all you can do in that situation is make it to the best of your ability mm. and keep your ego out of the way as much as you can. And talking of keeping your ego out of the way, uh, there's a certain politician uh, in well, there's a number of politicians in certain countries who who look to talk about the China virus, and it's all China's fault. Um, you have a, a a different perspective to balance things out. What's what's your view of China and its part in our world geopolitics and what we should all be more aware of, really, and um, and how we look at it from different perspectives? So there's a bandwagon at the moment which is to demonise China, uh, and I'm not I'm not sitting here making any great claims to China. The things that I think China is criticized for around the world are probably in some circumstances justified. But the reality is it's by some measures the largest economy in the world. It's certainly by any measure the second largest economy in the world. What China has achieved economically and socially over the past few decades is probably the most phenomenal thing that, well, it's so that it is the most phenomenal thing that any of us will see in our lifetime in terms of how a country transforms itself completely against the odds. I think China is a hugely, uh, a hugely influential, possibly the most influential country that's going to shape the future of the world over the next few years. I stress again, I'm not claiming that everything China does uh, is is right or justifiable, but China is a fact of modern life in a way that no other country is. And it troubles me and worries me that we are acting, I think, out of a sense of hysteria. Mm. And politics is a tough game, and you can't always choose who you want to be friends with and you can't always act with a, you cannot always expect the distinction between right and wrong to be very clearly laid out in front of you. Yeah. And I think this idea that we want to blame China for the virus, we want to punish China for Hong Kong, we want to blame all the world's cyber technological vulnerabilities on Chinese companies, I think is, is, is profoundly and self-defeatingly wrong. Yeah. And I think a more, a more nuanced, a more balanced, a more pragmatic, a more self-serving strategy would be to engage with China, to, to air more of our disagreements in private rather than on the front pages of the newspaper and just recognize that the, the, power has shifted in the world it may not be to everybody's tastes but it's a reality yeah very wise now richard um we've come to the end of our time but before we go I, i'll let and, and thank you so much for some fascinating insights and opinions uh and, and just experience that you've had ben what's the the final question you'd like to ask richard before we uh, say goodbye and uh, bring us here to a close yeah, I just want to say massive thanks, Richard. It was, it was a really interesting um, interview. And uh, thanks to all those people that asked um, questions. Thanks to Don, Gary, um, and uh, let me see, Nigel, who, who asked um, questions on the stream. Great to uh, have you on board and, and interacting. Um, we always ask at the end, end of the, of, of, of the uh, interview just whether you have, have a, a book, which is um, either one which you um, have found important in your life or, or just one that you're reading right now, which is, um, which is really interesting and uh, great for, for, for crisis, COVID, lockdown. Well, this may, be, this may be minority interest, but I recommend it nonetheless. 
Uh, there's a book called Islands on the Edge of the World by Charles McLean. And it's the story of the Hebridean Islands of St. Kilda, right off the far west coast of the British Isles, and the story of their human habitation until 1930. Uh, it's beautifully told, it's beautifully written, and it's a story of endurance, of resilience, of tragedy, of the human spirit, of the power of the natural world, the puniness of mankind in the face of that natural world, but also the ability for us as a society to prosper in the most inhospitable circumstances. So if I had to sort of wrap all those things together and try and learn some lessons for what we face now, then Islands on the Edge of the World by Charles McLean might be a good book to turn to. Fantastic. Richard, thank Thanks you again, Richard. My pleasure. Thank you very much, everybody. Take care. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.